Welcome to Lecture 3.1, Subgroups. In this chapter, we will introduce the concept of a subgroup and begin exploring some of the rich mathematical territory that this concept opens up for us. As you likely already know, I think I've said it a few times, a subgroup is some smaller group living inside a larger group. So before we embark on this leg of our journey, we must return to an important property of Cayley diagrams that we've mentioned and hinted at, but we haven't really analyzed in depth. This feature called regularity will help us visualize the new concepts that we will introduce. Let's begin with an example. Okay, so consider the group D3. It is easy to verify that F, R, F equals R inverse, say from the Cayley diagram. Thus, starting at, here's the key, any node in the Cayley diagram the path FRF will always lead to the same node as the path R inverse. In other words, the following fragment permeates throughout the diagram. Observe that equivalently, this is the same as saying that the path FRFR will always bring you back to where you started. In other words, if I take this equation and I multiply on the right by R, then these cancel and I get FR equals, sorry, FRFR equals the identity, this thing right here. So here's a key observation. The algebraic relations of a group, things like this, give Cayley diagrams a uniform symmetry. Every part of the diagram is structured like every other. So let's look at the Cayley diagram for D3. Here it is below, using generators F and R. So we can check that indeed this relation holds by following the corresponding path starting at any six nodes. So this is F, so that's blue, red, blue equals backwards red. So let's pick a node and go blue, red, blue is the same thing as going backwards red. So again, blue, red, blue is the same as backwards red. There are other patterns that permeate this diagram. Do you see any? Give you a moment to think about it. Here are a couple. F squared is always the identity. In other words, following the blue path twice gets you back to where you started. And R cubed equals the identity. So no matter where you start, if you do three R's, you get back to where you started. Here's a definition. It's a little bit informal, but I think it gets the point across clearly and unambiguously. So a diagram is called regular if it repeats every one of its interval patterns throughout the whole diagram in the sense described above. Naturally, every Cayley diagram is regular, and in particular, diagrams lacking regularity do not represent groups, and so they are not called Cayley diagrams. Here are two diagrams that cannot be the Cayley diagram for a group because they are not regular. And let's check this. So here, red, blue, equals blue red but if you do that here red blue does not equal blue red or uh, what else can we do um, here red blue red equals blue but that doesn't happen over here red blue red does not equal blue and similarly here in this diagram there's a lot of uh, so, well so here's one red red is the identity, but down here, red, red is not the identity. And there's a lot of other examples of where regularity fails. Now, let's recall that our original definition of a group was informal and unofficial. And one reason for this, really the primary reason, is that technically, regularity needs to be incorporated in the rules. And it wasn't incorporated in any of the four rules. Otherwise, these diagrams would represent a group of actions. Like if you think about our four rules, every action is reversible, any sequence of actions, and if you think of actions as being paths, well, then both of these diagrams satisfy those rules, but they're, they're not groups. So we've indirectly discussed the regularity property of Cayley diagrams, and it was implied. Mostly once I gave examples, it was suggested, but we, haven't spelled out the de we have not spelled out the details until now. Here is a formal definition. 
when one group is contained in another, the smaller group is called a subgroup of the larger group. If H is a subgroup of G, this is how we write it, we, we, H is less than G, and we don't say less than G, we just write it like this, or we use this notation. And I want to emphasize that these things mean exactly the same thing. So unlike numbers, where these symbols mean different, this is less than, this is less than, or equal to, sort of like with subset notation, these things mean the same thing. So just because we don't have an equal sign under here does not mean that these things are necessarily different groups. So all of the orbits that we saw in previous lectures are actually subgroups. Moreover, they are cyclic subgroups, meaning that they are generated by a single element. For example, the orbit of R in D3 is a subgroup of order 3 that lives inside of D3. So we can write this as the group or the subgroup generated by R, or the orbit, is this set of three elements, which is a subgroup of D3. In fact, since the subgroup generated by R is really just a copy of C3, that is, it's isomorphic to C3, we may be less formal and write this, that C3 is a subgroup of D3. And this is a little bit sloppy, but we write it because we expect the reader to know what this means. And I say it's sloppy because C3 you can think of as 0, 1, and 2 under addition, and D3 you can think of as those six symmetries, r, r squared, f, and so on. So let's continue with our example of D3. Now recall that there are five orbits of D3, which are these five sets right here. Remember, of the six elements, r and r squared generate the same orbit. Now here's the Cayley diagram, and notice that the orbits corresponding to the generators are staring at us in the face. So the orbit corresponding to r is this subgroup right here, and the orbit corresponding to f, the orbit of f, is this subgroup right here. Now the other orbits are more hidden. For example, this orbit of E and RF is hidden here and there, and the orbit generated, or the subgroup generated by R squared F is here and there. It turns out that all of the subgroups of D3 are just cyclic orbits, but there are many groups that have subgroups that are not cyclic. And here is an example of that. Z2 cross Z2 cross Z2. We will explain the exact notation later, but it probably should be clear from this example. So here's the Cayley diagram on the right. So you can think of this as the three light switch group. Remember we saw the two light switch group earlier. Or you can think of this as the set of binary, not, uh, yeah, binary uh, triples, and the operation is just addition modulo two. So a copy of the subgroup isomorphic to the Klein-4 group is highlighted right here. This is a subgroup, but it is not cyclic. Because the group V4 requires at least two generators. Um, for example, we can take 0, 0, 1 and 0, 1, 0, and those things generate these four elements, which is a subgroup of Z2 cross Z2 cross Z2. So every non-trivial group, G, and by non-trivial I mean G contains more than just the identity element, has at least two subgroups. So it always contains the trivial subgroup of just the identity, and here I'm calling the identity E, but it, it may be 1 or 0 or something else, depending on what group we're in. And also the non-proper subgroup G, that is every group is trivially a, sub, a subgroup of itself. So let me ask you a question. Which groups have only these two subgroups? Does that question make sense? Do you have a conjecture, I guess? We'll come back to it shortly. But let me do one example first. So it is not difficult to see that the subgroups of Z6, this is the integers, modulo 6, are the following. It's the trivial group, in this case the group of just 0, the subgroup generated by 2, that's these three numbers, the subgroup generated by 3, these numbers, and finally, 
the non-trivial group, or the whole thing, which is generated by 1, and also by 5 if you prefer. Now, depending on our choice of generators and layout of the Cayley diagram, not all of these subgroups may be visually obvious. For example, here are two Cayley diagrams for Z6. The one on the left corresponds with the generating set of just one, that's the, the red arrow, and the diagram on the right corresponds with the generating set of two and three. Two is the green arrow, and three is the blue arrow. And I want to emphasize that this group is cyclic, and that just means it can be generated by a single element. It doesn't mean that it has to be. So just because this Cayley diagram has two types of arrows and thus two types of generators, that does not mean that the underlying group is not actually cyclic. So we'll do one more example. That's D4. Now D4 has 10 subgroups, though a lot of these groups are isomorphic to each other. So there's the trivial group of size 1 or order 1. There's the entire group of order 8. Here are five groups of order two. These are all orbits. And these are all, all obviously isomorphic because there's only one group of order two up to isomorphism. And then there are three subgroups of order four. This one is cyclic, and these two are not, so they are isomorphic to the Klein four group. So a quick remark, uh, we can arrange the subgroups of any group in a diagram called a subgroup lattice that shows which group contains other subgroups. So let's do it for this group up here. So here's the subgroup lattice of D4, all 10 of the subgroups, and these are ordered vertically by subset inclusion. What I mean by that is this subgroup generated by R cubed F is also a subgroup of this subgroup. Th this is contained in this because this lies above it, but this is not contained in this subgroup because there's no path going from here up to there without, of course, going way above and back down again, which is not allowed. Okay, so we will conclude with a terrible way to find all subgroups. So this is a brute force method for finding all subgroups of a given group G of order N. This algorithm is horribly inefficient. It makes for a good thought exercise. So the first step or the zero step is that we always have the trivial subgroup and the entire group as subgroups. Th then the, the first step is to find all subgroups generated by a single element. These are the cyclic subgroups because they are subgroups that are cyclic groups. Then find all subgroups generated by two elements. There are n choose two pairs of elements. So create all the subgroups generated by those. And we can keep going on and eventually we get up to the uh, last step where we find all subgroups generated by n minus one elements. Now along the way we will certainly duplicate subgroups. This is one of many reasons why this is so inefficient and impractical. However the algorithm works because every group and every subgroup has a set of generators. Soon we will see how a result known as Lagrange's theorem greatly narrows down the possibilities for subgroups, rendering a lot of these steps just completely unnecessary.